Starting now, you can get a transcript of each week's Rich Dad radio show. Just visit www.richdad.com radio and download a copy today. This is the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And so today's program is really about young people and what are we teaching them? You know, my question I've always asked people is, what did school teach you about money? And, and for most people, the answer is, nah, it's a flat line. They don't, they don't really learn anything. And they're uh, stuck with the mantra of go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, buy ETFs and all that stuff, which is, I don't think it's going to get you there personally, but um, if it works for you, it works for you. But anyway, today we have a fantastic program. First guests are our our father and daughter team. Uh, The young lady is 17 years old and she's already an entrepreneur smoking along the way and she's having a great time. And our second half of the program will be a young man who came up from, let's say, the projects. You know, what is it like to be raised in, 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 uh, lack of a better word, the ghetto, you know, the the dark side? And how does a person get out of that? So it's going to be a very interesting program because children are our future. And, you know, it's tragic what's going on for so many young people. You know, they they come out of school with uh, student loan debt, which they'll never amortize. They'll never pay that off. So they're stuck for the rest of their lives. Then they can't find a job even if they get to graduate. And then uh, now they're talking about paying a minimum of $15 an hour for people not to work. Well, that's kind of interesting also. So we're a completely different world. And this is the world that Rich Dad was created for, you know, 21 years ago is because I want to know what the heck do we teach our kids about money? And the answer is nothing. Absolutely nothing. And we think we have problems today. We haven't seen anything yet. When these young people come up, I mean, all over the world, they call it the lost generation. You know, so many young people graduated from school. Like I was just in Spain. This guy graduated from school and he's a taxi driver because he can't find a job. So this is what's going on in the world today, and I think our school system with the student loan problem is almost a criminal enterprise. You know, it's fraudulent. You go to school, get into this debt, and then voila, there's nothing there. So we have some good news on that side, and the bad news, we want to find out what's going on with young people today. So our, our first guest today is Liana Giancola and her father, Len Giancola. Liana is this beautiful young woman, 17 years old. She's in high school, a junior, and she's already a very successful entrepreneur. And her dad, Len, is a very successful entrepreneur and investor. And so Len comes to us from NOLA, New Orleans, one of my favorite city. And Liana is coming from uh, Northeast Florida. So first of all, Len, welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you, and thank you for all that you do. Well, thank no, thank you. I mean, uh, you know, congratulations on raising such a, a spectacular young woman. You know, I mean, we, we met at the One Life Fully Live conference or Go Abundance. I have met some fantastic speakers at those conferences, but you know, the highlight was both meeting you and Liana. So, tell me Liana's story and how is it she's an entrepreneur today? Sure, I'll, I'll let her. You know, tell her story. But from my point of view. Um, I, I grew up the traditional route, so I did go to college. I had two parents that were both corporate employees, and I graduated college, and my dad got my foot in the door on Wall Street in the financial industry, and I, I worked on Wall Street and, and ascended through the ranks rather quickly and became the youngest managing director in the Americas for my company, and over 12 years, I realized it wasn't fulfilling me. And, and if I was being paid the nice salary I was being paid, how much was the company making? And I was paying a you know, huge percentage in taxes, as you're well aware how that works for employees. And I wanted to have a transition. So at 33 years old, I retired from Wall Street and became a serial entrepreneur and business builder and business owner. And my daughters saw that transition. They were young at the time, but over the last 15 years, I've transitioned into, you know, I'm, I'm on the board or own over 30 corporations, and I know all of those advantages of life now, being a, you know, on the B and I quadrant as opposed to the E and S quadrant, as you so beautifully detail in your books. And Liana came to me with her little sister, Sophia, at the time when they were 14 and 10 years old, and they said, Mom, Dad, 
tell us how you do this. How do you do this entrepreneur life? You know, how do you invest? Tell us about it. And I said, well, let's see if you're serious. If you really want to learn about this, there's a great little book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I'd like you both to read it independently and then present to mom and dad independently what you learned from the book. And that was the beginning. And I, I think I'll let Liana take it from there. That was the impetus for everything that came in the last four years since then. So, Liana, why don't you kind of well, tell well, your story to well, Mr. Kiyosaki? Well, first of all, thank you very much because that's where I write the book for. You know, it's really for the children who are coming up because that was the advantage my rich dad gave me that my academic poor dad, a great guy, he could never give me because he's an employee. Mindset's different. So, Liana, what happened to you? Tell us your story. So from my point of view, I always grew up seeing my parents having the freedom that they wanted to go on vacations with me and my sister and my parents. All my friends would have their parents home on the weekends. They'd be like, my dad's home the weekend, this weekend. I can go hang out with him. And I was like, I get to see my dad every day. What are you talking about? So I always knew there was something special about something different about my childhood growing up. And a couple of years ago when I was, like my dad said, when I was 14, uh, we went to the One Life Fully Lived conference in Philadelphia, and I got to listen to a bunch of speakers talk about their path to success and how they all got started and what they were doing now. And I had never really thought about what I was going to do after high school. I kind of had a vague idea of, you know, go to college, get a job, and then maybe I'll become an entrepreneur. Who knows? And actually hearing people talk about how they did it, and it kind of just started making me think about the fact that I was getting to a point where I was a freshman in high school, I needed to start figuring out what I was going to be doing and how. And so my sister and I went to my parents and we were like, we need to start doing something. We want to start doing something. How do we start doing something? And like my dad said, we read your book and we each did a project on it and we presented it to our family and we talked about how we had just learned so much through this one book. It was incredible. And it just went from there. We started going on family mastermind weekends. We would talk about different types of investments at dinner and learn about everything that there was to know. Well, not everything yet. But, You're still um, learning, so right? <laughs> I'm definitely still learning, and that's right. why I go to the One Life con Conference where I got to meet you. I'm still going to all these things so I can still learn because I'm still very young, and you know I don't know everything there is to know, and I want to know as much as I possibly can. Um, that's a fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that's a fantastic attitude because I'm still learning too. I mean, I, I can't believe anybody says I know everything. You know, so c congratulations. <laughs> Keep learning. Yeah. Would you say your classmates and your neighborhood are fairly affluent? Um, a little bit. I think a lot of them think they are, but aren't exactly. Um, I've definitely had to open the minds of a lot of teachers and students and people that I know about this entrepreneurial way of life. What, um, what, what, what would they, what was the pushback or the concern or the, what you have to, what you have to sell them on? I just had to sell them on the fact that it's not just me going out into the world, like how many millennials are labeled, like I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to make money and it's going to be great. <laughs> Is that I actually, <laughs> I, I actually like, I like, had, I like your tone. <laughs> Um, I actually had a plan of how I was going to become an entrepreneur. We had a five-year plan of me trying different, well, me and my sister trying different investments and learning different things. And it wasn't just me running out into the world thinking I know everything. Like I said, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to know a lot of things. And a lot of my um, teachers kind of didn't really understand that. And friends honestly didn't understand that either. Um, so I kind of had to explain that part to them. What, what was their point of view, your teachers and then your classmates' points of view? I think they just didn't really understand what it was that we were doing because um, I'm sure we'll end up talking about this some more, but I'm not planning on going to college. I'm planning on just becoming an entrepreneurial full force after high school. And for a lot of teachers, obviously, that was a huge like slap in the <laughs> face. They were like, what do you mean you're not going to college? You won't be successful. There's no way you can be successful without a college degree and trying to explain to them that it's possible for me to do things without a college degree was very hard for them to get around. And a lot of them still haven't um, 
but I've definitely done my best to open their minds to this other way of life. Well, congratulations. You know, I'm not saying to everybody listening, I'm not encouraging people to get out of school or don't go to college. You know, college is great. You're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, where something that requires a college degree. But as you guys know, is that even Warren Buffett says the best place he's learned, he didn't learn much in college, he learns more in seminars. Like he did Dale Carnegie courses, you guys are doing One Life Fully Lived or Go Abundance. And to me, the seminar world, if, if the teachers are good, a lot of them are flakes and conmen and crooks, but today the information is in seminars, not in schools. School's too slow. So anyway, congratulations for pushing that. Any comments there, Len, about your daughter and not going to college? I mean, does that send pangs of fear and terror through you? Not at all. I actually <laughs> support it 100%. Um, as you can imagine, I, I, I've spoken at her high school, I think, seven times last year. Well, they're a brave school to the bring look. you in then. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, there was a little pushback there, but we did connect with a few kids, and I had so many nice emails. You know, you know, translating that rich dad mindset to them when they just weren't exposed to it at home or in school. And that financial literacy is such a weakness in our school system right now. And Liana has this advantage being around Go Abundance and One Life Fully Lived and that, that mindset to just, you know, be financially free and, and you know, collect cash flowing assets as opposed to liabilities. And it's just been so enlightening for her. And as you can imagine, how proud I am to watch her blossom. Yeah. So, Liana, what, you, ha, you have your own LLC, and you've started multiple businesses. What's one of the businesses you started? Um, so, I don't want to start out by saying that every business my sister and I have started, every investment we've done is 100% with our own money. A lot of people ask us that, and they think, you know, our parents gave us a bunch of money, and we invested it. But, no, it's completely from savings accounts that me and my sister had had since birth, pretty much, and had just had their sitting there and we're like, we should do something with this. And that's how we started with investing and everything. But the main um, business that I'm focusing on, we have our investing, but I also have um, a coaching business where I coach younger kids. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. I coach younger kids about how to start a business and how to learn about financial freedom. A lot of it, what I'm teaching them is actually from Rich Dad, Poor Dad and from the cash flow game and everything I've learned. You know, Thank from you. you. Bless you. Bless you, my child. Story. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just kind of teaching them because, like you said, they don't have this financial literacy taught to them in school, and a lot of them, their parents maybe don't have the time to start teaching them, so I want to help them to understand how money works, how to start a business, and how to – just learn about everything there is to learn about money and financial freedom. Right. Let me ask you this. Do you charge your money for this coaching service? Yes, I do. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> give, give me, what, what is your model? What's your business model? How much do you charge? And da, 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 da. Um, it's two calls per month, and they're 15 minutes, about 15 minutes each, and I charge $25 per month. You're kidding me. <laughs> God, and these kids have the money? Um, their parents pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Len, what do you think of all this? It's amazing. She, she's th- This kid has amazed me. She's spoken in Whistler, Canada at a family conference. She's spoken at Temple University at the One Life Conference. And now she has a, a Rolodex of 15 coaching clients that pay her every month, and she's really helping these kids. So she likes getting the little paycheck she gets, but she also really enjoys helping the children um, have a, you know, embrace a different mindset. So it's just amazing to watch. Liana and Len, I'm very, very proud of you. I'm touched. I'm like a proud grandpa here going, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> and, you know, that's the reason my wife Kim and I created the, first of all, we created the cash flow game in 96 and we wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad in 97. But th- this, this is the most, uh, the happiest part of why I do this work. So I want to thank the two of you, and congratulations. Please keep going. Thank you so much. so much. Yeah, and thanks for coming out to me at the One Life Fully Lived and Go Abundance and all that, because otherwise I would never, you know, there's so many people around me, but you guys stood out. So thank you for coming up and letting me know your story. Of course. Thank Thank you for impacting our lives. Thank you. All right. No, thank you. You impacted my life. So thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. And we come back, we'll be talking to another gentleman, Will Little. 
I met him at the same conference, One Life Fully Lived or Go Bundance. They have fan, they're fan, I've met some fantastic people at these conferences and they are really hardcore entrepreneurs and teachers and they're really givers, not takers. So when we come back, we'll be talking to Will Little. He's, uh, his book is Icy, I-C-Y, and we'll tell you what that means in a little while. But he'll be talking about what, it, what it's like to be a child from the other side of the track. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. Financial freedom begins with financial education. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Radio Show. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. So once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android, and you can listen to this program again. It's all, pro, all of our podcasts are archived at richdadradio.com. And the reason we archive them is so that you can listen to this program again, because the more you listen to something repetitive, it's like a golf swing, the, the, the smarter you get, the more you learn. So you listen to this program a second time, you'll get even smarter. But most importantly, if you have friends, family, or business associates, download this podcast, get together, listen to it, and discuss it, because then your education will go through the roof. So our theme today is, how to, what, do, what are we teaching children and about young people becoming entrepreneurs. And when I was a kid and um, I told my poor dad, I'm not gonna, you know, I, I dropped out of the MBA program. I said, I'm gonna become an entrepreneur. And my poor dad, you know, being an academic from Stanford, Northwestern, the University of Chicago, he was just shocked. And then when I made the paper, because of my nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business as being an entrepreneur, my dad was embarrassed. I said, what's, what's wrong, what's wrong, dad? He says, you know what entrepreneur means? And this is a school teacher talking. So what does it mean? It means you're a crook. Only people or entrepreneurs are crooks because they don't have real jobs. So anyway, that's what we're teaching our kids today. And nothing has really changed. If you listen to Liana Giancola and thank her for being on a 17 year old high school junior, successful entrepreneur has no plans of going to college. I'm not recommending it, but I tell you, you, you know, the, the old mantra of go to school and get a, you know, get a college degree still is around even in me. And Len Giancola, her father, who has encouraged Diana. So on the other side of the track, we have my man I just met at the same conference. It's a Go Abundance or One Life Fully Live. Fantastic organization, great speakers. All, all real entrepreneurs have their story to tell. And Will Little is the reason I gravitate to him is that when I left Little Hilo, Hawaii back in 1965 to go to school in New York, go to Kings Point, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and my roommate is from Washington, D.C., from Anacostia, I think it is, one of the roughest areas in all of D.C. And so for a year, Tom and I just sat there, and I, I was telling it to Will Little, who's, who's coming on right now, I learned about their life. I mean, I, I thought I had it rough growing up in Hilo, Hawaii, you know, where the t life was tough when the surf was down. But, to, you know, to sit and talk to Tommy, I won't mention his last name, because unfortunately uh, the city, the ghetto got him. I mean, he started making a lot of money when he graduated, and he started doing mainline heroin and mm. took his car off the bridge. So... Um, the inner city was still with him, no matter how much money he made, his college degree and all that. 
Anyway, he's my fan, a good, great, great friend for one year. So we're t- our guest today is Will Little, and he wrote a book called Icy. It stands for Inner City Youth. It's available on Amazon, The Life and Times of Will Little. And I think Will's story will captivate you. So, Will, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me, Rob. So, uh, I understand you're a convicted murderer? Yes, I am. And you're also an entrepreneur in the drug trade? Yes, I was an entrepreneur in the drug trade at a, teen, at a young teenage years. So, tell me, how did you get convicted of murder and drugs and what happened and what turned your life around? Well, actually, I, was, um, I grew up in a single-parent home. Uh, my mother, she was uh, abused by my father, my husband, and then she moved away from North Carolina to Philly. So when we came to Philly, you know, I was just me and my mom and my three sisters and my grandmother, you know, so I was raising basically myself. I was a quiet kid, a real shy, and um, I didn't really have a role model to follow. My sisters always had my mom to look up to and see what it was to be the ideal woman. And my mom struggled with jobs working in restaurants and in bars, you know, so we didn't really have a lot of money. Some nights we didn't really eat. Uh, some nights we didn't, the, water, the water was cut off, you know, because she struggled trying to raise five children, you know, because she had another child once she got here, another little sister I had. And, you know, just growing up watching that, seeing my mom go through her struggles, financial struggles, and also seeing her deal with her demons because her mother died when she was 11 years old in a car accident. They were both in a car accident, but her mother passed away and she survived. You know, so she was dealing with a lot of demons at the same time. And just me watching that growing up as a kid, living in this kind of environment with drug-infested violence, um, poor education, you know, a lot of people didn't really care about themselves or their lives. You know, so just being a, living in that area became a product of my environment. And the only way I seen out of that was, you know, trying to go to school and get straight A's in school and become a sports player or something like that or either go to the streets. Now, the streets influenced me even more so because it was money right there on demand, supply and demand. And, and you learn how to sell drugs and, and you know, cook up. Um, coke and stuff like that right there in your neighborhood because there are guys actually using it and guys out there selling it. You know, so I found a means to make some money for myself where I can become independent. How, how, old, how old were you when you first started doing your first deals? 15, 15 15? years old. Yeah. You know, and um, it kind of felt, I felt good about that, being able to buy my own clothes, get my own hair cut. You know, my mom, she didn't really know too much of what I was doing because I was real secretive and real quiet when I was doing things, so she didn't know. She was too busy at work. Um, so um, I got deeper into the drug trade, drug training as a time went by at 16, 17 years old. I dropped out of school at the age of 17 because I became bored with school, and I figured the only thing I, I would be able to do to make money is hustle and sell drugs. So I picked up that skill, and then eventually a friend of mine was murdered, you know, and um, that kind of affected me emotionally. I was upset and I was angry, walking around with that, no therapy, no one to talk to about it, just me and my friends, my peers, and we all dealt with it the same way. It was just that to arm ourselves even more so we won't become victims in our environment again. And then eventually I got into another, a shootout with another group of guys, and I wound up killing some, another young man at the age of 19. And uh, I went to jail. Me and my friends went to jail with a shootout, so went to jail and we was charged with a lot of charges, murder, conspiracy, attempted murder on a witness, aggravated assault, and like we was facing a death penalty. And um, went to the preliminary hearing, we had all had lawyers, I had some drug money left over, so I hired a lawyer to represent me, uh, to try to get that first degree off me, which he did. And then I wound up getting sentenced and found guilty of third-degree murder, which a lesser charge, which carried 15 to 30 years or 10 to 20 years. And um, I wound up getting sentenced um, to 15 to 30, but my justice ended five years, thinking that I would become something better. I don't know what he's seen in me in the courtroom, but he's seen something in me that he said he had sent me away for a long time, but not too long, just long enough to get my life together. And my first year in prison, you know, I had a son. So... Um, that you had a son. Was, you already had a son by age nineteen. Yeah, I, I, he was born when I was in jail. So when oh, I went God. to jail, my my girlfriend was two weeks pregnant. You know, and about ten months, nine months later, you know, she had him. So just being in a hostile environment, being in prison was really hostile. It was the worst prison in Pennsylvania at the time. Everybody waiting on trial. It was a lot of murders that year, like five hundred eighty murders, 
every mafia gang was in there. The Italian mafia, the black mafia, everyone was in there. So it was real rowdy and violent and wild riots all the time, fires. I mean, fighting guards and guards beating people up. I mean, so it was really, really a hostile environment. My mom was very afraid of me because she all, she, all she knew of me as this young little kid that she raised, quiet little child. She didn't know what the person I became because the streets had made me that person. You know, and um, when my son was born, it was more for me, more so an epiphany for me. Like, you know, I don't want him to go through this. I don't want him to live this kind of life like I lived because I didn't have a father. He has a father. I want to be a father. So the best way I could be a father was to educate myself, you know. Um, so I began to, you know, understand me, start researching myself, researching my history, like you know, how I become this kind of person and what kind of individuals I was when I was a kid and what kind of skills I had, what creativity did I have, what kind of imagination did I have as a child, what did I want to be when I grew up, you know, all the things that were lost in the streets. So so actually, so actually being incarcerated was a good, th- good thing because it gave you the time to think. Right, it gave me time to think, you know, yeah, because I wasn't thinking as a kid. I mean, that's one of my gifts, because I was thinking I always watch people, and I would learn this by watching and not really just asking, asking questions and talking, because I really had nobody to talk to. So a lot of times I've I observed, I observed my, my surroundings, my surroundings, and people that are around me. I learned behaviors. I learned people's behaviors. You know, people who are sincere or true or people who are false and fake and lie and trying to get over, because it's a real tricky city. I mean, so I picked up on a lot of, a lot of people's habits. And um, when I began to change my life around, you know, I just resorted back to my old stuff as a kid. Like, how was I? I was tenacious. I was inquiring, inquired to, you know, I wanted to inquire about certain things. And I was, like, reading and studying. So I started studying and reading again, you know, writing about my life in general, writing about myself so I can understand me. And that's the biggest problem is that we grow up. You don't know who we are. So especially if you don't have parents, I mean, that's in your life or just educating you in your life. You may have some men who, some of my friends that had fathers in their family, but in their in home, but they wasn't present. You know, they was there, but they wasn't really present in their life. So um, it's more so we just teaching each other um, the ignorance upon ignorance. And what we thought was being a man or what we thought was making money or what we thought was being, being successful in life, you know, and it was all the wrong things. And it let me in jail. So when I was there, so, I just so so actually, jail was a good thing because it gave you time to get out. And right. uh, you're out now. And you wrote "Icy," inner city youth came out 2017. And you're right. on a mission. Huh? What kind of mission are you on? Well, I'm on a mission to educate our community because what I see in the community, being a community activist, I've been home 20 years now. You know, I, the 10 years in prison, I came home, but 20 years on the street. And ever since I, I hit the floor running, when I left the prison, I said, I ain't never going back to jail. I'm going to go back to my community where I did most of all the crime and try to educate the young people who were in the same predicament I was in, lost, no guidance, fatherless, and things of that nature. So I started going to the schools in my neighborhood and started sharing my experience and, and, and teaching what I learned. How was how, how the receptivity? Because you're kind of going great. against the tide, aren't you? Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, it was great because a lot of people want change. They don't know how. They just don't know how to do it. Oh, they don't good. Have courage, good. They don't have the courage to change. You know. So we're seeing a person that come from my background, where I'm at, and and making that change, making that difference, standing up and saying, "This is what a man is like. We've been fooled. We've been tricked by the streets. This is what being a man is. This is what this is what being taking care of your responsibilities are. Owning up to your owning up to your um your responsibilities, standing in your truth. This is all about. I mean, this will come whole, come human again. So I had to rehumanize myself. I mean, I'm teaching people how to rehumanize themselves because we try to we try to dampen the blow by using drugs and stuff like that, or or, or intoxicants to try to deal with our, our our emotions and our feelings. Yeah. So you know. So, and, so so well, you know, what happens is, according to him, like I said, my roommate at the academy, he says the call of the street is so strong. Right. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? He says, you tell a, you tell a young guy he's going to make ten dollars an hour when he can do ten dollars a minute. Do you, you know what I mean? Right. It's, yeah. And 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 it's more fun. You know what I mean? It's it sure beats sitting at a Seven Eleven for ten bucks an hour. Right. And you're on the street having fun. There's the women. There's the music. And he mm-hmm. says it's it's the call of the sirens. You know. He says the call of the street is intoxicating. Right. How do they avoid the call of the street? Well, just by teaching them how to deal with peer pressure. A lot of it's peer pressure. Because of your circumstances you grew up in, you may be poor, you may not have certain things you don't you want. But it's actually getting them to identify who they are first. Because if you don't know who you are, you're going to become what the streets think you. 
And a lot of these young guys, I mean, once you see the repercussions, I mean, of some of these activities that people are doing, you, you pointed out, saying this person went to jail for the life, this person got murdered. Do you want this to be your end? Do you want this to be your life for a moment of pleasure? Yeah, I, I understand I mean, that, but th- does that work? You know, because let me tell you something. If if I was a kid, mm-hmm. and I can make ten bucks a minute versus ten bucks an hour, and no, not pay taxes, and it's fun, and the chicks like you, I well, don't know just, which way I. I think I know which way I would go. You know. Well, it's fun, but it's also risky. I mean, because it's real. I mean, it's, it's not that it's not that easy to say I'm just gonna make money and I'm gonna make ten dollars an hour because a lot of things come with that. I mean, and death is one of the things that really come with it, especially in this day and time when you have young people dying every day. Uh, I, I understand that. The, 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 the so, terror side is terrible. But like well, I said, I mean, my, my roommate from school, you know, he was making about a hundred k a year when we graduated in 69. Mm-hmm. But the street came back, if you know what I mean. Right. Yeah, and everybody don't get that opportunity to reach that far to get that, that, that deep in, or that big in that kind of business either. And most of the time, everybody who gets bigger than that, like, we look at all the guys who pay for the drug trade. You can never look at American Gangster. You look at all these different movies and stuff like that that portrays the documentary of these lives they live. All of them, all them lost. All of them died and went to jail for the rest of their life. Right. I so, and it's, is, so, is it getting any better, or is it the new generation coming up and a bunch of old Gs, you know, old guys re-educating them? Well, I mean, it's not a bunch of old guys we educate them, but it's a few of us out there trying to re educate them. Because some of the older guys still ain't educated themselves. You know, so it's, it's very few, I mean, of us who are really stepping up and, and showing them how to navigate their way through the streets, through the trials and tribulations they're going through. And most likely, like a lot of times, I try to teach emotional intelligence to a lot of parents so they can teach their children themselves. Good. I mean, a lot of parents are going through a lot of things emotionally, emotional scars, whatever trauma they dealt with when they were younger, people are still dealing with it today. So the best thing is to set these classes and get multiple involved with self-education and self-awareness and entrepreneurship. You know? so, so your main thing is just standing up and saying this is, you, you go out there and talk to them straight. Right, and show them. It's yep. just showing them through my actions, showing them what I'm doing throughout yep. the day. Right? Good for you. And, and, yeah, and that's how they, they grab it. And the book is doing it really good. The book is really inspiring a lot of people. Um, they know they read my story from all over the country. This inspired them to say that they can persevere, they can get through whatever trial tribulation they're facing, and just understand how to navigate through life. And, and that's why I'm getting a response from my book. Like a lot of write ups, even on Amazon, it's five stars on Amazon. People are responding to it white, black, Chinese, Asian, American, everybody responding to it really, really well. So it's a, it's a lesson. Yeah, because it's not really a race problem, it's a young per- right. person's problem. Right. So, right. so right. Will Little, I want to thank you very much again. I'm glad I met you at uh, One Life Fully Lived. And again, Will is the author of I See, I See Why Inner City Youth, The Life and Times of Will Little, 2017. It's available on Amazon. Please get the book. And we need to understand, you know, it's like I said, one of the best educations I had was talking to my roommate at the academy, you know, for a whole year. And getting right. to understand what it's like coming from what he called the projects. So, Will, yeah. thank you very much for your contribution and your commitment to continuing to speak out and re- and show young people and parents the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, thank you again. Once again, that's Will Little. His book is ICY, Inner City Youth. So when we come back, we'll come at the most popular part of our program is where you get to ask me questions. It's Ask Robert. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. 
That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. Log on to RichDadRadio.com while you listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. So I want to thank again Liana Giancola, 17-year-old young woman, a successful entrepreneur, and her dad, Len Giancola, who encourages her to become an entrepreneur and investor. And, and Liana said on the program, she has no plans to go to college. She just doesn't know why she should go. And also we had Will Little. He's a motivational speaker and life coach, convicted murderer and drug dealer. But he's also an entrepreneur, you know, from the other side, as my roommate did. And uh, my, I said, my roommate, you know, he he did the right thing. He got out of he got a scholarship, came to the academy with me. But this, but the draw of the streets is too strong, and it was eventually drugs that took him down too. So anyway, we have uh, you know huge problems right now. So once again, you can submit your questions as a most popular part of our program is Ask Robert, and I get to you get to ask me, and I'll answer your questions for you. So submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. And once again, all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com, so you can listen to this again. And it's especially for you to listen to it, but also to have your friends, family, and business associates listen to it and discuss it. It is in discussion we begin to take some action. Just reading and listening is not enough today. We've got to take stronger steps. And you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. So going to ask Robert, Melissa, what's the first question? Our first question today comes from Deidre in New York, New York, favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She says, Robert, what motivates you at this stage in your life? What makes you want to continue to evolve both personally and professionally? Well, it's, it's not happy. You know what I mean? I, uh, I have more than enough money. Money is, money is pretty easy. But I always ask the question, what do our schools teach kids about money? What did you learn about money in school? And the answer for most people is a flat line, bzz, nothing. Go to school, get a job. And that was fine back in the dark ages when I went through school. You know, that, that doesn't work today. Today, the number one asset for the U.S. federal government is student loans. Number one asset. I mean, that's how the government makes the most money, is student loans. Today, student loans are $1.5 trillion problem with a default rate of hitting 20%. That means 20% of those who take student loans are wiped out financially for the rest of their lives because the most horrible loan you can get is a student loan debt. Credit card debt is lightweight compared to student loan debt. So I, 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 all, I say this harshly because that's how concerned I am. Our school system is complicit in a fraud the fraud that if you go to school, your life will work. It is a fraud, and then to charge people all that money is criminal at the most horrible interest rates possible without financial education. So that's why a long time ago in the 80s, I became an advocate for financial education or the education my rich dad taught me. And as you heard from Leanna Giancola and Len Giancola, as they read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, they play the cash flow game, and their lives are different. But our school systems do not encourage that. They want you to just, it's basically a factory of memorize, memorize the right answers and out the door, and by the way, pay off your student loan debt. It's a criminal organization today, run by a bunch of labor unions, the HFT, you know, the, I mean, the AFT, American Federation of Teachers, and the NEA, National Education Association, what Forbes Magazine calls the National Extortion Ex Association. So our, our school systems are broken. Everything is broken. I'm not saying the teachers are bad, but they don't, they're not educated either. And they think they're doing the right thing, but unfortunately, if you look at the results, it's not working. Hey, sports fans, going to school isn't working today. And yet you always want more and more taxes. Teachers are on strike all over the place. Here in Arizona, they're all on strike. They got a 20% raise, they're still not happy. You know, as, as I said, our rich dad, chapter lesson number one, the rich don't work for money. The rich work for assets. No, no, you gotta get a job. And you see, it's so messed up. Again, the school teachers are not bad people. They're like my poor dad. They're just financially ignorant, uneducated. That's the reason I keep going, because the problem is not getting better as far as I can see. So we've got to find out why our schools don't teach kids about money. I have the answer, I write about it all the time. But it's profitable to have ignorant people. So next question, Melissa, please. Our next question comes from Sam in Orange County, California. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert, 
I have two daughters, both college educated. They each married the wrong guys. Both of their husbands became drug addicts. The girls are now single mothers. One has five young children, one has three. They have to support these kids, and now they are basically living on the system. My question is, as a parent with adult children and financial crisis, what, if anything, can we teach them at this point about money? Well, I have good news and bad news, and I appreciate the question, and I feel for you. Um, I was talking to a police officer because we have to hire, we have to, my neighborhood, I have to hire real police officers, not not rental cops, real police officers. He says the opioid epidem- epidemic is getting worse because they cut them off of opioids because they tightened up. It didn't solve the drug problem. So they go to lower and lower cost drugs because they can't afford opioids now. So this is a growing, growing problem because people are unhappy. Pure and simple, they're unhappy. You take a drug because you're not happy. So as far as, I wrote a book called Why A Students Work for C Students because I became a student of the education system. And what I found out is by the time a child is 21, if they don't have any financial education, it's almost impossible because the mind changes every so many years. So, you know, the brain is different up to age four, then it starts to change at eight, and then it changes at 18 to 21. So for your daughters to make changes right now, it's gonna be like, you know, being obese and getting back into shape. You'd have to, you know, start running, jogging, educating, doing all those things. And if you have young children, you know, it just becomes a double-edged sword and works against you. So that's the bad news. The good news is, not to be commercial, but that's why I created the cash flow game. You can sit there and actually do something. You know, I learned everything playing Monopoly. And the New York Times called the cash flow game Monopoly on steroids. Because the fundamental financial literacy part of life is called a financial statement. Income, expense assets, liabilities, statement of cash flow. That's financial literacy. That's in rich debt, poor debt. And the average person doesn't know income, expense, asset, liability. They don't know what a statement of cash flow is. So how can they change their lives if they don't know that? How can they change it? You know, I go to my banker every day, you know, whenever I go to him, my bankers never ask me for my report card. My banker never said, well, Robert, what college you go to? What was your GPA, grade point average? They never asked for that. All they want to see is my financial statement. I don't have a financial statement. They won't lend me the money. I mean, it's that simple. It's that simple. It's nothing to do with a FICO score. That's how ignorant people are. They don't know what a financial statement is. Financial literacy begins with income and expense, which is called a P&L, and then asset liability, which is called a balance sheet, and then the statement of cash flow. If the cash is flowing into your pocket, it's an asset. Cash is flowing out of your pocket, it's a liability. It ain't that hard, sports fans. So that's why I created, I wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which Leanna Giancolo, the young 17-year-old girl, studied. She plays a cash flow game, and now she has her own business teaching other people the same thing my, my rich dad taught me. It's not that hard. But when you have a bunch of ignorant mothers, you know, out there, I mean, you know, I don't want to use the word, like most of our political leaders are financially ignorant. That's why we're in financial trouble. You know, I mean, what did Obama know about money? I'm not Republican or Democrat. And, you know, George Bush was just a rich guy whose daddy gave him every, all the money in the world. You know, he was not a very successful entrepreneur. So all of this stuff is going on. And yet we, 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 we still sing the same mantra, like if you go to school and you get a job, your life will be saved. Hallelujah, brother. But the facts are, Jack, you're coming out of school, you don't have any financial education at all, they, they taught you nothing. You're taught by people who are not rich people, they're good people called school teachers, but they're poor mentally. They need that job, that's why they're on strike all over the place right now. So that's what's really going on in our country. The solution is simple, but it's not easy. You know, like like Liana Giancola, 17 year old, she plays a cash flow game. She knows assets from liabilities. She knows that school she knows that school's not gonna teach her that. So why should she stay in school? And then Will Little, you know, he's an entrepreneur also, murder and violence. So either way they're entrepreneurs. And if we don't make, do something different with our education system system, because they're a criminal right now. NEA, National Extortion Association. They don't really care about education. They just want to get higher pay raises, less less work, and more benefits. 
It's a horrible system right now. It's broken. So that's why that's why I keep working. That's why I don't stop because I don't see it getting better. So for those two young women, if they start by playing the cash flow game, then teaching their kids to play the game, there's a shot at it because it's a physical process. You have to make mistakes in the board game. And our schools punish you for making mistakes. Also, you cooperate. But in school, they punish you for cooperating because it's called cheating. Our system is broken, sports fans. So anyway, I thank, I thank all of you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. Thank you for the questions I asked Robert, and thank you for listening.